Okay, so hello everyone. So thank you for attending our this week Rutgers in Teaching AI seminar. And today we're glad that we have the Dr. Arvind Natarajan from the Colocom AI Research to give us this talk. So Arvind is a staff engineer at the Colocom AI Research, working on ultra low power computer vision applications. Prior to joining Colocom, he received his PhD in computer engineering from the UT Dallas working on concurrent data structures. He's the author of the multiple research papers that has been granted six patents. So now let's welcome uh, him to give us this talk, Efficient, Always on Computer Vision. Thank you both. Thank you for the kind introduction. So hello everyone, my name is Arvind and I'm a staff engineer at Qualcomm AI Research. So today I want to talk to you about efficient, always on computer vision. Uh, actually, well, that's not entirely true. So today I want to talk to you about efficient ultra low power always on computer vision. And this is quite a mouthful, you know, as you can see. But the thing is, if you want something to be always on, you want that system to consume as little power as possible. Right? So uh, in the, as, a, as a part of this talk, I want to focus on what ultra low power always on computer vision is. Some of our often battery powered use cases that come up. Uh, the product and software that we have. Uh, and finally, I'm going to show you some videos of ultra low power always on computer vision in action. And note that during the course of this talk, I'm going to be using the terms always on computer vision, ultra low power computer vision, and ultra low power always on computer vision interchangeably. But I'm referring to the same thing. So let's begin. So what exactly do I mean when I say ultra low power always on computer vision? So our target was to have the sensor at one milliampere on a lithium ion battery. And note that this is the entire system power I'm referring to here. Why this particular number? Because uh, most always on sensors, and you can think of uh, sensors for audio wakeward detection or accelerometers in your pedometer, they use this amount of power. We also wanted low latency with a typical frame rate of about one to 30 frames a second, depending on the application. I know that once we get to like 30 frames a second or even higher, as we've seen, uh, we, we enter the realm of real-time uh, applications or at least near real-time applications. Additionally, in most of our applications, the information from computer vision is what we want and not necessarily the image itself. This is in stark contrast to a lot of traditional computer vision applications. Uh, historically, the, the image sensors itself take on the order of tens of milliwatts to watts of power, and image processing takes further hundreds of milliwatts to watts of power. So you can think of the use cases for uh, ultra low power always on computer vision as falling into several categories. Uh, first, the sensor could be moving, and this is your smartphone or tablet use case where the sensor is moving spatially, with uh, sp uh, spatially over time. Or the sensor could be fixed, and these are your smart home, smart city, or IoT type use cases. Uh, they can also be categorized based on whether the ultra low power sensor triggers the higher power, higher fidelity sensor, or it could be the only sensor in play that uh, collects data or triggers an application. As an example of the former, you can think of face based auto wake of the screen, which is also context aware. Specifically, uh, a person would not need to tap their phone or lift their phone, press a button in order to wake the screen. You could have an always on sensor mounted in the front that is constantly scanning its uh, field of view. And if a face were to appear in front of that uh, camera, you could trigger an iris sensor for uh, IR, uh, sorry, an, uh, yeah, an iris sensor for iris authentication or a face sensor to perform face, face, uh, detail, face uh, recognition in order to unlock the screen. And the user would not need to have even touched the phone for this. You can also think of uh, security camera type use cases that could benefit here. Uh, specifically, you don't need uh, to have the higher power camera constantly uh, you know, on and recording the scene. Instead, we could have our ultra low power always on sensor monitoring the scene. And if something interesting were to happen, uh, like a person were to come into the field of view or a car were to drive by, then you can trigger the higher power camera. As an example of the latter category, where it's the only sensor in play that triggers an application, you could think of an occupancy sensor in a room where, uh, in, for example, in conference rooms, uh, if a person were to enter, then the sensor could detect the presence of a person and turn on the light. 
And after maybe a couple of hours, uh, you could again, you know, trigger the sensor. The sensor could then uh, also keep uh, monitoring the scene. And maybe if it detects that no person is in the room for two hours, it could then turn off the uh, turn off the light in the room. Another use case I want to highlight here is the virtual reality and uh, and, and augmented reality. So I'll show you later on in my talk how we can use uh, ultra low power always on computer vision to enable such uh, use cases. So our system uses a third party uh, third party sensor with a lens on the module as seen here, which makes it very easy for our customers to use. We've also designed a low power digital die that uses a low power MCU, which does some of the algorithms and computer vision aspects of it. The hardware block does most of the processing or most of the acceleration of the computer vision algorithms to keep the power low. And when an event occurs, we wake up a higher power processor to either uh, collect more data or continue processing. The entire system is built from the ground up with privacy in mind. We do not send any images out except uh, only, oh sorry, only metadata like bounding boxes. Uh, the entire system power from the photon hitting the lens to the metadata coming out is one milliwatt. Okay, and this is this is a really really low number. We do not come across anything else in the market that does computer vision at this power, and we're able to achieve this while running real time computer vision algorithms like object detection, and without needing to perform any duty cycling. Here are some use cases that we can facilitate. We can detect several different classes of objects and uh, humans are our favorite. Huh. So uh, we have several human body detection models uh, for different viewpoints and use case, use case scenarios. Uh, for example, uh, when the subject is close to the sensor and you can think of a conference room scenario where you can't see the entire person, but we can, in that case, we can use this half body model which detects the top half of a person as seen here. Uh, and at far distances, for example, in a hallway, we can use the full body model, which allows even detection at distances of up to 60 feet. These use cases are fully accelerated by hardware, so we can keep, the, uh, keep it within a very low power envelope. A very important feature of our sensor is that we allow detection at multiple orientations, specifically 0, 90, 270, and 180 degrees, as seen here with the face model. There is no need for the user to train for each of these individual orientations, and you don't even need to augment your data set with faces rotated at these orientations. You can train with upright faces alone. We can also run other algorithms with a conjunction of hardware and software acceleration, uh, for example, change detection, as seen here, where you're monitoring a scene, and if uh, a change were to occur, like somebody were to walk through the scene, then you can uh, you know, further process that, that frame or the region of the frame where the changes occurred. We also can detect a variety of static and dynamic gestures. As an example of static gestures, uh, we can detect the rock, paper, and scissors gestures that you know, people use while playing that game. And I'll show you a demo later on of uh, me playing the computer using our sensor to detect the uh, gestures. And uh, we can also detect lightweight optical flow-based gestures, uh, as seen here, with, uh, for example, somebody moving their hands in a left-right, left pattern in front of the sensor. We can also detect a lot of uh, 2D markers and logos, for example, this uh, fiducial marker, as seen here. And we can also detect 3D rigid bodies like toys. These models are very easy to train and are actually very compact. We can also run multiple models concurrently on our hardware, as seen here where we have the face model and the fiducial marker detection model running simultaneously. We are not limited by the number of objects, only the model size. We also enable a lot of uh, retail use cases as seen on the right-hand side here. For example, at the top, you could have the sensor looking inward towards the shelf and detect whether a product is in stock, whether it has disheveled or if another product is obscuring its view. And in any of these cases, you can send a message out or, a, or an alert out to the uh, warehouse uh, manager in order to uh, have them clean up, uh, restock, or remove the obscuring product. Another use case is here where uh, you can have the sensor looking outward and uh, detect whether a person were to come into the field of view. And then you can collect analytics like how long a person spent looking at a particular product. Again, I want to be I want to stress here that the privacy of the consumer is critical, and therefore we do not send out any images, only statistics over time. 
Our image quality is monochrome, and uh, typically it is much lower resolution than a cell phone. And in many real-world use cases like IoT, we deal with very challenging light -like scenarios. But still, we're able to do really well. For example, we can see here with face detection at uh, 0.1 lux. In fact, uh, personally, I, I can't even discern that there is a face here. Uh, and also, we can, do, we can detect full body at about 3 lux, at distances of about 20 feet. And we're able to achieve this because of our proprietary exposure com control algorithms. And these algorithms also help us perform successful detection at the, in the opposite scenario, where, it is, where the scene is extremely bright. For example, here, we have the sun in full view of the sensor, but we are still able to clearly detect the presence of a person. Uh, any normal camera would have completely darkened the scene in order to even out the exposure. We train our model and develop our algorithms to be uh, resilient to such scenarios. And this is, again, very different from traditional computer vision. I want to highlight here that our sensor is also sensitive to 850 nanometer IR, and this is very useful for no light scenarios. Specifically in such scenarios, if there is no ambient IR light, we could use an IR LED to illuminate the scene for detection. Again, in this case, uh, the power would be dominated by the IR LED and not necessarily our sensor. So how do we achieve this? Basically, we take a different approach to solving this problem. To us, the image itself is secondary to the information that it contains, because transmitting the image would be a major source of uh, power consumption. Additionally, for many of our use cases, uh, privacy is very important. So not transmitting any image and doing things locally is preferable. This is in stark contrast to a lot of traditional computer vision algorithms where, uh, computer, where the image quality is very important. Color is also, in those use cases, typically 24-bit RGB, and features like uh, autofocus or synthetic defocus like bokeh are very important in order to make the image look good. We are at the other extreme. For us, monochrome is sufficient, and in some cases, even less than 8 bits works. Focus is only important when, uh, is, is only critical when we are trying to detect objects that are, uh, that are uh, uh, when we are trying to de detect objects. And pixels are only important when we're trying to detect objects that are small or, or are very far away. We don't really need the high resolution images uh, in order for uh, detecting our objects. And everything else that uh, you know, traditional computer vision applications do is for image quality, which in our case, we trade off for power. In tiny ML applications especially, pretty pictures are not as important as the information that they contain. We also look at the entire system power, uh, including sensor and algorithms, and not just the inference power. This is in stark contrast, again, to a lot of traditional computer vision applications, which uh, take the image as a given and then only perform the inference. We also shoot a lot, uh, shoot a lot in uh, low light and uh, very other uh, adversarial scenarios, for example, with the sun in full view of the frame. And this is in contrast, again, to a lot of uh, traditional CD applications where either the subject uh, would be moved away from direct sunlight or a flash would be used in case the scene was very dark. We just cannot afford to do this from a power point of view. Power consumption and memory utilization play a critical role in the design of our algorithms. Again, very different from uh, traditional CV applications. And finally, uh, in most of our use cases, frame level accuracy is not as important as detecting events. So at this time, I'd like to stop and see if there are any questions uh, that I can answer. Hi. Hello? Hello, yes, I can hear you both. Yeah, yeah, so actually I have one question. So here you mean sure. that, so in this always on scenario, so actually we, we don't care about like the, the depth information uh, yes, so we're not, we're not, uh, yeah, we're not using, uh, we're not, yeah, we're only detecting objects or detecting change. We're not really uh, using any kind of, yeah, we're not uh, trying to gather the depth of the scene, for example. Uh, I think we could use other sensors for that. I think there are like time of flight sensors that could, uh, you know, get you that information. Oh, okay. So you mean that for the, uh, for the camera itself, so we will not use like the, in the depth camera, but we'll use some other Yes, sensors. we are not using that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're not, we're, uh, yeah, we're, yeah. 
this is a yeah so oh, yeah a QVGA or QQVGA camera that we're using here. Yeah. Oh okay 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 thank you. Yeah. All right. So I guess we can continue on. So uh, we we also favor algorithms with adaptive compute. So what does that mean? In other words, we favor algorithms that get more complex as the scene gets more complex. And likewise, these algorithms get less complex as the scene gets less complex. Uh, the reason for this is because uh, most of the time in IoT type use cases, not much interesting is happening. So we can run our lightweight algorithms first, and if that is sufficient, we can terminate the pipeline there. We also favor algorithms with content adaptive capabilities, meaning that the closer an object looks like uh, our target object, for example, the closer it looks like a human, then more compute is performed. This is again very useful in IoT type use cases because most of the time the scene is not very interesting. This is in stark contrast to a lot of the uh, traditional uh, state of the art uh, or traditional computer vision algorithms that use neural networks, which take the same amount of time irrespective of the scene. We also try to simplify compute. In traditional computer vision, typically what happens is we have one model and then we run the image through it. Then we downscale the image five or 10% to continue detection at the different scale. This downscaling operation is a lot more power than we can afford in our system. So instead, we, what we do is we have a uh, scale of models that span the entire, uh, uh, we have a set of models that span the scale applied to an image. And then uh, we, uh, we, we downsample the image to X both horizontally and vertically and to continue to use the same model in order to save power on scale. We also optimize brightness to favor detection. And again, this is to save power. And what this means is that typically our images are darker or have much higher contrast than is comfortable to look at for humans. This is, uh, this while again, you know, this is because we're not really interested in the picture itself, but we find that this is actually really good for our detection. We also optimize the entire system. We use a low power sensor, we optimize the IO, we move the core compute algorithms to hardware when possible. And uh, we, within that hardware, we put memory as close as possible to the compute so that multiple blocks can work in parallel and at higher throughput. The product that we have is the Qualcomm QCC112 chipset, which has been commercialized. And many of the use cases are supported at one milliwatt, which is the system power. This feature is an ultra low power MCU, a vision accelerator, uh, embedded power management, a streaming array processor, and we're able to get to this ultra low power target through circuit level innovations like custom memory, which gives us a 2x lower runtime power and a 3x lower retention power compared to the standard cell in the library. So this far, I've told you all about the features of our low power sensor and you know, so how can you actually use this in your application by training your own models and running it on a hardware? So the answer to that is the AOCBS portal, which is the suite of easy to use training tools that customers can use in order to train models that run on our hardware. So we use this, uh, we, we, our customers, we provide several stock models like the face model and the human body detection models that I've shown earlier, but we also enable users to train their own custom models with data collected from other sensors. This uh, data preparation tool uh, converts the input data into a custom file format that is used by the trainer tool, which trains the model and outputs, uh, uh, outputs files that a converter uses in order to generate the final model file that can be loaded onto our hardware. So our training is heavily accelerated. And uh, so the tuner tool that we have here generates Pareto optical parameters that can provide multiple knobs for the user to tune and optimize performance in an offline manner. We also have a, an evaluator tool, which is bit exact with the hardware and allows users to test their models out on a, on a system, on a, on a Windows laptop or a Linux desktop, for example, and uh, see how the model would perform uh, prior to running it on hardware itself. Note that we cannot support off-the-shelf neural networks here because they cannot exploit our hardware acceleration. To summarize, training is a fairly simple process. We feed in the input the positive samples and annotations to the data prep tool, as well as the negative, uh, uh, negative examples. And the data prep tool also provides data augmentation capabilities. So uh, this is then converted into a custom file format and used, for, used in training, 
which is uh, which then outputs a, a series of model files that are then combined into a single model file that can be loaded onto our hardware. And uh, given a test set, we can run through it on our evaluator tool and also using our tuner tool, find the set of Pareto optimal parameters to optimize power at, uh, at, uh, you know, at runtime versus the true positive and false positive rates. The AOCGS portal comes with a web-based UI and it can be installed both on Windows or on Linux in a containerized form. You can uh, run it on your local laptop or on the cloud, and you can connect to it from the browser of your phone or your uh, laptop, for example. Once you have the data in a required format, there's no need for you to even write a single line of code in order to cycle through the entire suite. The UI is useful for quickly onboarding and ramping up, but we also have a command line API for those who prefer that. So here we're showcasing our evaluator tool. Uh, so all of our tools come with uh, job tracking where you have access to the job history. You can modify a job and rerun that job with minimal effort. On the right, we have the detection results, which is and the information that comes out after running on the evaluator tool. And this is the same information that would come out from our hardware. So basically you have the uh, six uh, bounding boxes as well as their coordinates here. For example, you have X, Y, W, and H. The set of parameters for this uh, evaluator run was determined by our tuner uh, tool. So tuner generates a curve of Pareto optimal parameters that we can choose from depending upon our performance metric and compute trade-offs. So this slide shows the uh, tuner output for the fiducial marker detection slide uh, detection shown in the previous slide. These uh, three plots come from compute limit and the curve shows what happens to the performance when it is higher or lower. This compute limit is a number that has a direct impact on power and latency of the system. A lower value of the compute limit means a lower latency. What we can see is that at low false positive rates, by increasing the compute limit, by allowing a greater value of compute, we can get to a higher accuracy. Uh, so this red curve here, if you notice, is the compute uh, limit at uh, 27,500, while the green is at 22,500. So these curves, of course, are very close here, and that's because this is the simple fiducial marker detection model that, uh, we are, that we are showcasing. For real applications, these curves will typically indicate a much larger improvement in accuracy for more allowed compute. We can tune these knobs on the fly without retraining and change the performance as we desire. So next, I want to actually show you some of the demos of ultra low power always on computer vision in action. So I want to begin by uh, showing you some uh, gesture detection with the with our QCC112 sensor. So here, uh, this is the setup. So uh, this is our you know, sensor. It is connected to a Windows laptop. And uh, the, this laptop is running an application that basically, uh, so where I'm playing against the computer. The computer is player one, and it automatically generates a, a uh, randomly picks a gesture from rock, paper, or scissors, and I perform my gesture here, and my gesture is shown on the right-hand side here. And basically, the uh, yeah, this is a game where uh, you know rock beats paper, or oh, sorry, paper beats rock, uh, scissor beats paper, and uh, rock beats scissor. So that's the game, in case you're not familiar. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm doing my gesture here. Uh, the scissor is detected here, and the computer is randomly picking a gesture and uh, the results of uh, the, the, you know, who wins is shown here. All right, so changing focus a little bit. So AR and VR, augmented reality and virtual reality applications are getting a lot of popularity these days. And uh, such devices are becoming increasingly battery powered and they have multiple power hungry processes like audio, video, interaction, and all of these processes are running concurrently on these devices. So how can we actually use ultra low power always on computer vision to get any benefits here? I'll talk about that now. And uh, just to uh, let you all know, Qualcomm is a leader in the augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality space. And uh, uh, yeah. 
So accurate pupil detection is actually a key component in ARVR application, in the ARVR use cases, because it enables a lot of downstream applications. So building a robust pupil detection model is very important. Instead of processing an input stream, which is high resolution or VGA, we can bend the input down to a QVGA image, which is 320 by 240 pixels, or a QQVG image, which is 160 by 120 pixels, and then use our QCC112 module to detect the pupil with lightweight models. Once we detect the pupil, we can extract the region of interest and then pass it downstream for either applications like eye gaze tracking or iris authentication. So earlier on in my talk, I had mentioned that uh, VR use cases could benefit here, right? And so uh, clearly, by if once we have the eye gaze information, we can perform, we can use it for performing foveated rendering. And foveated rendering, if in case you're not familiar, is a technique where only the region that the eye is looking at is rendered at high definition or much higher resolution, whereas the regions in the periphery where, the, where people are not directly looking at can be rendered at a much lower resolution. And this saves an enormous amount of power in VR applications. And in either of these use cases, we can transmit the metadata like the region of interest. So here we have some uh, sample videos uh, showing the pupil detection under varying light conditions. In the top left uh, here, we have ambient, we have an indoor scenario where the ambient light is about 150 lux. In the middle uh, here, actually we have reduced the, uh, we have reduced the exposure time of our sensor to about uh, 10 milliseconds. And even though as humans, you know, uh, we really can't perceive uh, the pupil here, our sensor is able to detect it without any trouble at all. I want to stress here that this contrast stretch version here that we have is purely for visualization purposes, just to, to show you all what this, these frames actually, or what this video actually looks like. There is no contrast stretching of any type going on in our hardware. Also, uh, I had mentioned earlier on my talk that uh, our module is sensitive to IR light, uh, 850 nanometer IR. So we can, use the, we can use an IR LED in order to illuminate the eyes. And then we, in that case, we can get, in fact, sub one millisecond exposure times as seen here. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is that our module is using a general purpose lens, and that is more suited for IoT type applications. So we should be able to get much better results with a lens tailored for AR and VR applications. So uh, here we have some results of running pupil detection on our QCC112 hardware. Using IR illumination, we have been able to achieve 60 frames a second consistently. Uh, with an exposure time of sub one millisecond. And we've been able to do this while maintaining the image quality. We've also been able to push the frames per second to higher values, uh, including up to 100 frames a second by reducing the exposure times and by overclocking. But so far our module has only been rated for up to 60 frames a second. The power consumption, however, still continues to be in the single digit milliwatt range. Our pupil detection models are actually very small, only about 40 kilobytes in size. And again, I want to emphasize that we don't transmit any images, only metadata like region of interest. So here is a demo of eye gaze tracking in action uh, using our QCC112 module. So the subject is actually wearing a modified eyeglass with the QCC112 sensor mounted directly in front of their right eye. And they are looking at a TV screen with a spot whose location changes periodically. By tracking their pupil and by using uh, uh, regression, we can predict their gaze point. And so uh, the right-hand side here shows uh, the predicted, uh, the ground truth gaze point, which is the location of the spot of the screen. And the, the blue cross shows the predicted gaze point. Uh, note that, as you can clearly see, the uh, prediction is very close to the ground truth itself. And this is what actually we were showing when uh, I was talking about how we can perform foveated rendering uh, using our QCC 102 module. So uh, one thing to note here is that we have a much lower frames per second value uh, in this video. And the reason for that is because uh, we are transmitting the images to our development laptop in order to generate this video so that we can uh, show it externally. But uh, this 
this collection of images is purely an internal feature. It is strictly used for development and debugging, and we do not expose the transmission of images externally. And finally, uh, just here's a teaser of what is coming up in the future. So we are working on a next generation ultra low power AI inference engine that is targeted for computer vision use cases. And it supports uh, popular architectures like mobile net. And we've been able to get really competitive results with it. For example, with eye tracking, we've been able to get sub five degree estimation error. And this is using a model that's only 70 kilobytes in size. Uh, to give you some perspective, an off the shelf uh, mobile net model would be greater than four megabytes. We've also done some power performance profiling as well uh, for our face recognition model, which is uh, less than a megabyte. And it runs at 25 frames a second and consumes five milliwatts of power. And this has been spec'd at 250 megahertz and seven nanometers. To our knowledge, this is the first system that's ever been capable of reaching this power performance number. So uh, finally, uh, you know, if there's anything you take away from the talk, let it be the following. Uh, first, vision is a very challenging part of machine learning, and it's a very power-hungry uh, process. And we've been able to achieve sub one milliwatt uh, system end-to-end -end system power by, in, by through a series of innovations. And Qualcomm is the leader in the ML space, and I strongly encourage you to check out the link. Uh, uh, check out this link for more information about the ML projects that we're working on. And uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us with any queries uh, in case you have it, in case you have them. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you for a very great talk. And uh, so I have some questions, but I would like to uh, let the audience to ask first. So any yeah. questions yeah. from the audience? Um, I have actually one quick question. Uh, uh, great presentation, Arvin. Thank you so much. I actually, it's, this is not really my domain and I learned a lot. Um, so uh, my apologies for my <laughs> naive questions. Uh, so you mentioned about different uh, use cases for this very low power um, sensor and DNN processing right. module, uh, like yes, uh, I, for example, the pupil detection. Um, so uh, how complex can this handle? How complex of tasks can this uh, module handle? And where is that trade-off between how much power we should consume? This is of course a hard, maybe like a, a very general question, but for example, right. uh, I mean, going all the way to kind of image net detect image classification um, as opposed to pupil right. tracking. So uh, yeah, I would like to get your opinion on that end. Sure. So that's a good question. So uh, uh, of course, uh, we can detect several different classes concurrently as well, like image net, uh, you know, if I remember correctly, they had, uh, I forget the number of classes. I mean, of course, we're probably not going to detect thousand classes simply because our image may not have uh, uh, not that much detail. I mean, of course, uh, we have, uh, actually, no, I take that back. So we're not detecting thousand classes concurrently. But uh, uh, so uh, we can detect multiple objects uh, in the same scene, uh, like we had with the uh, uh, you know face and the fiducial marker detection model. It all and of course we have a grayscale sensor. So you know it it depends on how much detail we can actually see with the sensor itself. For example, if you know most of the details are like uh, you know very. Uh, Again, we are at a much lower resolution as well. So we're only about 160 by 120 uh, you know, pixels. So a lot of the detailed features, like, you know, like in a 3D object, if you have uh, a lot of uh, you know, bends or uh, you know, curves in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the object that form a part of the feature, then you know, we are probably not going to be able to detect that with too much detail. Faces, human bodies, you know, we can detect really well. But, and even toys, for example, we're able to detect very well. But you know, it just depends on yeah the on the on the object itself. Uh, you know the the detail, the level of detail that goes into the object. So yeah, I think uh, for us yeah, it, and uh, again you know we are also more interested in the frame in the event detection. For example, you know like if uh, we may miss certain detections in a frame, but then the, what matters is that since we're always on, we, we catch it soon enough. 
So, you know, so those are some things that we factor into our performance metric. Uh, for example, you know, we may have, you know, in one scene, uh, like, if, uh, like if somebody were to be walking from like direct sunlight into, into a dark region, for example. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe some part of their face is, uh, you know, slightly washed out for a bit, but then eventually, you know, we do hope, we expect that we will catch their face. So, yeah, those are the kind of uh, metrics that we're using. Uh, and in fact, yeah, we've been, uh, you know, we can detect, I mean, we are, of course, uh, maybe finding out what type of dog, you know, whether it's a husky or a Pomeranian, that might be a bit harder. I'm not saying it's impossible. We haven't tried it out, honestly, uh, because, of course, we haven't had a use case for that. Uh, so, uh, and just because they're, you know, much, they, they look pretty similar and the kind of level of detail we can get from them is uh, going to be harder to distinguish at a, at a very low resolution. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely a trade-off, uh, you know, as to what, uh, you know, we're going to be able to achieve with this camera. I understood. Uh, thank you. And actually a quick follow-up question um, in terms of right. underlying um, the hardware tech from the sensing uh, side. Um, so how adaptive currently the sensors are? So should it be fixed in terms of the resolution before they sense? So in terms of, I mean, I'm talking about the cameras or could it be kind of adaptive that they, I, I don't know, again, like not my domain, right. but can they, for example, turn off some pixels for lower resolution first and then go for more if they need more information? So, uh, so yeah, so I think it, our sensor allows us to capture in both QVGA and QQVGA. So QVGA is 320 by 240 and QVGA is 160 by 120. So you can potentially bin, uh, you know, do some kind of binning uh, to, you know, get the, uh, get like uh, reduce the resolution. Uh, we don't typically uh, like uh, change it on the fly, uh, you know, so it's uh, it's uh, pre-configured for a particular use case, uh, you know, depending on uh, the kind of image you want. Of course, uh, uh, you know, QVGA 320 by 240 is going to consume more power, like processing wise, it's going to consume more power than the 160 by 120. And we found that in most of our use cases, even 160 by 120 is enough, uh, you know, for the kind of uh, applications that we have. So, yeah, but yeah, but just to answer your question, yeah, we don't uh, typically, uh, you know, use it, uh, do it on the, uh, change it on the fly. We could use a, you know, potentially a higher power uh, sensor, uh, you know, more detailed sensor. But then, then again, from with that, we go away from, you know, ultra low power potentially, you know, and the sub one milliwatt uh, uh, system power, uh, because then the uh, image sensor itself starts to consume more power. And uh, yeah, so Mr. yeah, that's thank that you very much. The factor then. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so, Arwan, can you go back to your slides on the, I think the, your entire system, the A, B, sorry, I forgot. Uh, do you mean uh, the AOCVS portal? Are you talking yeah, about yeah, the yeah, software yeah. tools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have some questions for this. So first, uh, here you mentioned the AOCVS hardware. So this is kind of the GPU or CPU or something else. So we this is currently running on the CPU. So uh, you know the uh, yeah. So uh, the all these tools run on the CPU. We are working on GPU acceleration. So actually, I, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, Actually, some of these, uh, yeah, I think some of the trainer tools, et cetera, are actually already GPU accelerated. But yeah, actually, we're planning to uh, yeah, do some, uh, yeah, some of the, uh, uh, the data preparation uh, stuff we are still working on porting it to the GPU. So this is, yeah, GPU and CPU accelerated. But of course, it uses, it, it senses the, uh, you know, the system that you have, you know, right? If you don't have a GPU on your system, it's going to be completely CPU. But we are not, uh, but we, so it, yeah, it, 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 it the, the variant is chosen based on the, the characteristics of the system. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and so this is typically is run like not 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 at uh, this is train is not operated in the embedded end, right? It is like in the back. Yes, this is completely on your yeah, this is completely on your uh, Windows laptop or a server, and the output of this is what goes on to the embedded device. Okay. This uh, mm -hmm. the the converter tool generates a model and that's what you load onto the hardware. Yeah. Okay, I understand. And so this is like the, the training process is based like based on the PY torch or TensorFlow or something that the Qualcomm developed by itself. Uh, yeah, so we use OpenCV. Yeah, we use OpenCV for uh, yeah the train cascade. Uh, yeah, OpenCV. Yeah. 
Oh, okay, use OpenSea. Okay, okay, I understand. And also for the data preparation part, so so here this mm -hmm. data is the positive annotated data and the negative training. Right. So right. that is provided by the user themselves, right? Yes, yes, that is provided by the user. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, the user has to do a little bit of work. Yes, you know, like for the positive annotations and the data files and the, you know, then the negative samples. Negative samples really they don't need anything. They just need to give us images that don't contain the positive in any 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 image. So yeah. Okay, and also for the tuner here, it is kind of the automatic tuning, or the users still need to. So it gives you a range of parameters. Basically, you can it gives you multiple knobs to play with. Uh, you can so you can choose your true positive rate, false positive rate, and it'll uh, you know uh, give you a set of parameters that you can then choose from. Okay, and then how about those the hyperparameters? So the system will directly automatically determine them. Uh, yeah, it, it gives you suggestions. So uh, yeah, so yeah, it gives you suggestions on uh, you know uh, if you uh, like for example if you want to detect this size object at this distance, what are the what are the hyperparameters you need to tune for, and uh, you know or what are the hyperparameters you need to choose. So yeah, those kinds of uh, details actually we have now recently implemented into the uh, into this portal too. Okay, and also how about the topology of the, the neural model? So. So it is the user need to like to I clearly uh, identify so like what so how many layers I would like use or or the system. So uh, uh, so yeah, just to that? clarify, uh, uh, Bo, yeah, we are not we don't we don't support neural networks here. So this is a non we use more traditional computer vision uh, oh, okay. models here. So this is not neural network based. Yeah. So the, okay, the AI inference chip that we have coming up is that is uh, neural network based. But not this one. So yeah. So we don't have a pretty typical neural network parameters, uh, hyperparameters that we need to, uh, you know, adjust. Oh, okay, I understand. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And also, I have some questions about so the, the I think you have one slide about those the, the uh, I think the backbone mobile net. So uh, yeah, uh, let me see. Uh, you were talking about the last AI inference uh, slide that I had. Let me go through that. Uh, oh yeah, are you talking about this one? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, sure, so sure. wondering, so, so from the perspective of the industry I and mean, practice, so mm -hmm. typically, so uh, what type of the, the like the compactness approaches that the, the industry typically prefer, like using the knowledge distillation or the pruning, quantization, or sometimes the combine combination together? So. Right, so so definitely quantization is important. Uh, so one thing I do want to uh, uh, um, uh, mention here is that we are purely inference. So you know we basically we get a model, and we uh, we get a trained model, and that we load onto our uh, you know uh, onto our hardware. So right now I think uh, the only kind of uh, so since we are you know the initial phases of implementation, I think the only thing we're using right now is uh, quantization. We we don't have support yet for dropout or uh, you know uh, actually uh, doing that just for training, right? So yeah, we don't have uh, yeah, so we yeah, we are only using uh, quantization in order to compress the model at this point. Okay, only quantization. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but sometimes because quantization, like quantization, it's it has like performance limits up to like 32 times, right? Typically we will not go to right. aggressively. So, so, so what should we do if like the, if you would perform a very aggressive quantization, but the model size still kind of too large, we have to change the original model to make it more compact. True. So actually what we do is, uh, you know, we do quantization aware training. So, you know, that's actually been our uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, hammer or you know, key to get good performance. So we we do train, uh, we, we do quantization aware training, and at least for the IGS tracking and the face recognition models, we found that that works really well. Uh, I think yeah, potentially with the maybe other use cases, it may not. I mean, you may have to train, uh, you know, uh, differently, or you may even need uh, more, uh, you know, more advanced models. Uh, of course, you know, since we are embedded again and we're trying to keep the power limits so very low, we're, you know, more restricted or we're more uh, restricted towards uh, mobile net type architectures. Potentially, you know, if you if we were to, you know, slightly loosen our power restrictions, we could use, you know, ResNets, other kinds of, you know, much more, uh, you know, broader uh, networks that are more, more power hungry networks to get better performance. 
Uh, but yeah, for right now, for the use cases that we have, we found that uh, we're able to achieve it using uh, you know quantization of our training. Okay, understand. Then, like, how about those the other? Technology like the NAS, the neural neural architecture search. Right, neural architecture search. Right, right. So yeah, potentially yeah, that could be something that uh, you know we use. Of course, it won't be it won't be you know done on our inference engine itself. So that's something you know somebody who's training a model could you know definitely use NAS and uh, you know find uh, find whatever architecture does really well. But uh, uh, yeah, and uh, the, I guess the goal would be to you know be able to efficiently run that on our hardware. So essentially, the state space for NAS should be uh, you know layers that are easily mappable onto our hardware, and uh, you know this, that way you know we we get good performance as well, and we don't have these uh, you know because uh, on embedded devices you know the hardware is kind of optimized, uh, so you know the the networks need to follow a certain uh, you know like uh, like flow in order to you know be able to extract the maximum performance. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, you know like uh, misses, and uh, you know you're going to have to uh, load uh, have unnecessary memory accesses. So that's going to again consume increase your latency and potentially consume more power. So yeah, you need to, when we use NAS, we need to be able to uh, like uh, like uh, smartly select an architecture. Okay, okay, I understand. And, and also, <laughs> my last question. Yeah, so. Yeah, sure. Because here, what do you present is a very kind of very challenging scenario like this always on uh, CV. So, yes, yes. so this type of scenario, so so different from other like more conventional CV that we ha we have seen before. So do you think so? What is kind of right. like unique challenge and opportunities for those the, the model compression or the mass or something else? So so what is the, the particular point that we should take care of? So, uh, so do you mean in uh, for for uh, this ultra low power CV? What is the main challenge that we face? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. This is because so, this is a yeah. very extreme case, right? Yeah. Right, right. So I think uh, the our main challenge is the lack of, or you know, because we are so power constrained, the lack of uh, information, like or you know, so the amount of information that our image contains is very limited. Because you know we're a 160 by 120 or a 320 by 240 grayscale image, and uh, so you know a lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, you know uh, uh, for example face recognition is something that we can't do with our current uh, uh, current models, right? We can do face detection because you know all like faces you can look at the eyes, you know the nose, the mouth, you know sort of detect that there's a face there, but we can't really tell you whose face it is, even though even if you know we were to have some kind of um, uh, uh, I mean this we can't do this easily. So you know, so the, ch the challenges. So these are some of the challenges that we face. Where to keep the power low, we have made a lot of trade-offs. So and within those trade-offs, yes. So our use cases are more tailored towards always-on use cases. So you know, if we if we find a face, we we you know offload the task of face detection to some other uh, some other uh, camera, for example. So I think yeah. So I guess we have to think about uh, you know always on computer vision in a slightly different uh, you know view. Uh, not that it's not a one thing does everything. You know, not a one like you know this one camera or one sensor will do everything for you. But on the other hand, it you know it it saves you a lot of power rather than having a camera that's you know running a neural network processing every frame trying to look for you know a face. So just by you know triggering that camera when we detect a face, we can save a lot more power. Uh, than you know, using a just a pure simple uh, you know camera that's running all the time with a neural network. Okay, so in right. that case, so have you ever considered like use this like the spike in your work because that is kind of the event triggered solution. Ah uh, yes, so yes, event based cameras are also yes, uh, you yeah those are possible. Yes, those are again some things that we can use, but uh, yeah for us uh, you know I guess uh, you know uh, we are still uh, like very low power in the you know sub one milliwatt range. I'm not familiar with what the power uh, you know consumption of the uh, event cameras is, so I don't believe they are in the same range uh, just yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So. Thank you. Audience, do you have any other questions for our speaker? Okay, so if no more questions, so let's thank our speaker. So this is a very wonderful talk and actually I learned a lot from this.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Also, thank, thank you. And, and also thank all of our audience to attend our this week's talk. So our next talk will be uh, uh, two weeks later. So at the beginning of the, the August. So see you guys later. So thank you. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. You all too. Thank you. Bye.